you heard him introduce himself. Jerry Hatfield is here. Um, he's going to talk to us about programs and strategies for mitigation of soil-borne plant diseases. Um, I'm really excited. We're, we at the Center of Excellence are working with Jerry and, and Frank from Earth Knowledge um, on what I believe is going to turn, to turn into a large project of data analytics to pull together different research, different models, and figure out what are the, what are the triggers to these diseases, how can we make better decisions um, to mitigate these diseases, and I think that's going to go a long ways. I'm really excited um, at what we're doing together. So I appreciate you guys coming to this conference at all. The other thing about it is it ties together with so much else that everybody's doing. And if we work on soil salinity and, and things like that, and irrigation management, it all ties to soil health, which ties to what's helping at least facilitate these diseases, if not cause them. So um, it's a lot of exciting stuff coming together. So glad Jerry could be here today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read his uh, uh, introduction. He's, uh, he's director of the USDA ARS National Laboratory for Agriculture and the Environment, where he directs a team of scientists focused on developing innovative solutions to increase efficiency in agricultural systems, including specialty crops worldwide. That's the first thing I want to say is he is here from Ames, Iowa, but it doesn't mean he's only interested in corn and soybeans. He's, he's <laughs> very much in the specialty crop arena and, and very much uh, become interested in our segment of that industry. So we're, we're excited again to have him here. Um, his personal research focuses on quantifying the interactions among the components of the soil plant atmosphere system to quantify resilience of cropping systems <clears throat> to environmental change and the development of techniques to enhance decision making for agriculture. He's the agriculture lead of the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change process that received the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize and leads the agriculture sector for the U.S. National Climate Assessment. Uh, he served on the faculty of UC Davis as a biometeorologist and also worked at the USDA ARS uh, in Lubbock, Texas as a research leader on plant stress and water conservation research. Uh, he was appointed laboratory director of the National Soil Tilth Laboratory in 1989, which was renamed to the National Laboratory on Ag and the Environment, uh, where he is now. He's a fellow of the American Society of Agronomy the Crop Science Society of America and the Soil Science Society of America and the past president of the American Society of Agronomy. He's the recipient of numerous awards and was elected to the ARS Hall of Fame in 2014 for his research on improving agriculture and environmental quality. He's the author or co-author of 417 refereed publications and the editor of 16 monographs. Let's give him a hand. And as Paul said, I, I do come from corn and soybean country, uh, but I do spend a lot of time on this whole interaction between production and environmental impacts and diseases and all these different pieces. And the reason especially crop people are much more interesting than the corn and soybean people is that you have a lot more at stake uh, in terms of production. You have a lot more interest in terms of looking at how changes can be made quickly in the production system. Plus, when I talked to the corn soybean guys, if I told them that they had to invest $4,000 an acre before they ever got that crop, which you all do, uh, they just roll over in their graves uh, and can't fathom uh, that level of input. So I, would do, I do want to spend this morning and briefly just talking about the science of soil health because that piece has come up there a little bit in terms of the dynamics. Uh, just how do all, how's all this fit together in terms of looking at production systems and how we fit these pieces together. And it really gets down to the question of really what is soil health worth? Uh, why do you go through all of these pieces of this dynamic in terms of looking at the changes in soil health and what does this mean in, in terms of these dynamics? Here's my contact information uh, in all of this because I found that, and I do a lot of producer audience talks and things like this, that last line in terms of how to get a hold of me is always worthwhile uh, in this. And you can always so Google me. Uh, I do pop up in the top two or three Hatfields that you find out there. So, uh, but, you know, feel free to ask questions. We have this continuing dialogue. Uh, and over the past uh, 28 years, uh, as we built the, the lab, in terms of the research program, one of the things we have built it around is the producer interaction. We do conduct a lot of on-farm trials. Uh, we conduct a lot of different pieces. 
with industry in terms of how do we improve efficiency, how do we look at these different dynamics, how do we begin to bring these pieces together in terms of being able to offer solutions very quickly to producers. That short circuit, this normal process, when everybody says, well, it's going to take 15 years to roll this thing out, is that we really don't have 15 years. Uh, we've got a very short timeline on a lot of this. And there is nothing more important than understanding these disease complexes in this. And we have really been very unfortunate in terms of not bringing together the, the disciplines that it's going to take to address a lot of these issues. Uh, and that's what really fascinates me about uh, this project. And I don't even know how many conference calls we've had, Paul, to talk about uh, all of this and, and what it means. But I do want to talk about why soil health is important. Uh, I want to talk about the, the impacts of poor soil health and then how do we really begin to en enhance this uh, in this piece of the puzzle. I'm going to start it off this way uh, in terms of what I call the soil degradation spiral. What causes soil to become less healthy uh, in all of this? And you can put, uh, I'll let you choose what you think poor land management is uh, in this very first part. But one of the first things we see in the changes of soil out there is the stability of the aggregates. Uh, we, in forming sand, silt, and clay together in a nice stable aggregate, when we begin to induce something in that uh, soil that changes the land management, we see that change first. And we see it change very rapidly. Within one year, I can destroy a soil. And in one year, I can begin to change that soil uh, in this. So it is not the process that everybody says, well, carbon sequestration is going to take a long time. It takes 10 or 15 years to change the carbon content. We're talking about the stability of the aggregates. Uh, we're talking about how do we begin to stabilize those aggregates at the upper half inch of the soil. And that really is the gateway between the soil and the atmosphere uh, in all of this. So what you would see when we begin to degrade the aggregates is that we see crusting on that surface, we see compaction on that surface, uh, we see water and wind erosion, uh, poor infiltration rates, whether it be rainfall or irrigation uh, in all of this, and it really begins to change from that standpoint. If we begin to erode that soil or change that soil, we see reductions in plant growth. If we see reductions in plant growth, uh, we're no longer putting the exudates uh, and the root mass back into that that supplies the biology, and I'll spend a lot of time talking about biology. And then all of a sudden, when we begin to change that, we see influences in terms of yield uh, with productivity. And then finally, at the end of this spiral, is we wonder where the productivity of our soils go. Uh, so we built this whole degradation spiral and a lot of this to be able to understand uh, these dynamics. And, and just this is some long-term plots out of, uh, of uh, the Sanborn, Michi or Sanborn, Missouri plots and the Moore, Illinois plots. Uh, long-term rotations that go back to the 1800s uh, in all of this. And what we see is that we decrease both the organic matter content, both in quantity as well as quality uh, of these cycles in all of this. And we see this uh, pieces of this puzzle. And so we see these very changes going on in terms of organic uh, matter, but in reality we need to think about more about how do we begin to enhance the soil. And so that led me to build uh, what I call the soil aggradation climb uh, in this. Remember that the soil degradation spiral is, is depicted by a, a, a slippery slide going down. The soil aggregation climb, putting it back up, is like the Stairmaster. Uh, it's going to take some work. Uh, it's not something that you can slide back up the hill. Uh, it's going to take some pieces of this. But the first step in all of this in terms of how do we improve the soil is how do we begin to think about stabilizing the microclimate that allows that biology to begin to express itself. Uh, and the biology in the soil is just like you and I. What do we want? We want food, we want water, we want shelter, and we want air. Those four basic things that all of us want in life, besides lots of money, uh, is basically what the soil biology wants. We have to provide a home within that soil that provides those four things. And we don't often think about it that way in terms of the dynamics of where gas fits into it, in terms of the oxygen exchange, 
where water fits into it, where a shelter fits into it, where a food source fits into it, and all of this. And so what I often ask uh, producers is that if you only ate once a year in terms of the sources, what would you feel like? <laughs> You'd feel hungry that other nine months out of the year and all of this. And, and what we don't understand, and I'll be very honest with you, is, is how do things like pathogens and health in, and the positive bacteria and, and all this biology interact together. And that's a very, very big void. Uh, when we talk about soil health, we're talking about all these different things in terms of organic matter turnover, and improved nutrient cycling, improved water structure, improved soil structure, all of those things when you get to the top of the staircase gives you improved efficiency, improved yield, improved profitability and all of this. And a lot of these things are, are occurring as what I refer to as the invisible and dynamic processes. Uh, they're going on in the soil, but what we see is the visible outcomes. We see those changes in soil structure. We see improved changes in terms of water availability. We can even see improved changes in terms of some of the disease complexes out there. And, and so all of these different things. And so, but the first step of this is how do we begin to stabilize that biology within that? You can't till your way or add chemicals to the soil without the biology and expect it to be improved. And so this whole path in terms of improving soil is an extremely complex system in terms of how do we look at it. And then we look at, everybody talks about functionality of soil, because we want to improve water availability, we want to improve nutrient cycling, we want all these pieces, but they don't magically appear. <laughs> they don't magically appear at the end of the uh, system and begin to change. And so we got to think very thoughtfully about how the functionality of the soil works in a lot of this process. And so in all of this creation of this stable home for the biology to work, is you just have to ask some simple questions. What table would you rather eat at? Uh, because the biology wants what you and I want. It wants a food source. Uh, and how do we get that food source? Soils are, are extremely complex, and the unfortunate part is we only know about 5% of the soil microbiome. That means that 95% is completely unknown to us. And I think that's a great avenue of how do we begin to understand that and then when you get to how the positive and the negative bacteria interact together, it becomes even more extreme in terms of our lack of understanding. And if you, if you constantly expose your home to environmental damage, uh, you know, what's that relate to as well? But the, you have to realize that the soil is a living organism. Uh, there is more bacteria and, and all these other uh, aspects uh, within the soil that is an extremely complex system. Uh, it's complex because we don't understand much about it, uh, but it's also complex in how it interacts with all the other things that are going on. Uh, the physical, chemical, and the biological environment are extremely important, and we see a lot of these different dynamics going on. Uh, everything from mammals clear down to algae. Uh, in a real healthy soil, uh, we have the equivalent of two African elephants per acre. That's how much biology we have below the soil surface. And so you have to ask yourself, if you had two African elephants standing out on every acre, what would your first thought be? And I get a lot of reactions from producers on that. Uh, and they'll, they'll say, well, what's elephants going for on the spot market? <laughs> you know? You got other ones that say, well, you know, that's going to take a lot to feed two African elephants, which it does because two African elephants eat about 500 pounds a day. Uh, and so it takes a lot to feed those. Fortunately, what happens in the soil environment is extremely competitive out there. Things eat other things and there's all sorts of things. So there's a lot of turnover. But one of the things that we see coming out in all of these different pieces is that it's an extremely dynamic environment that responds very quickly to what we do in terms of management out there. And that really becomes very important when we begin to think about not only how do we improve the soil, but how do we begin to think about the management practices that go with that. When you talk about a specialty crop that's in a rotation with a small grain crop, all those other pieces, how does that really fit together in terms of changing that soil? Uh, how do we begin to look at new strategies in terms of changing the overall dynamics uh, of this overall system 
And I'll have to admit to you that we've paid very, very little attention to the disease complex or the pathogenic complex that goes with this. We don't even understand much about the positive aspects in terms of what it takes to build the soil up. And when you start mentioning to soil health individuals that there is much more attention that should be paid to the disease complex, their eyes just start to get glassy. They really don't want to think about that overall piece, but in reality, that may be the best place that we can look at a lot of this. If you look at stable soil systems, and this is just the, the aspect of uh, uh, a little cartoon that we put together, if you've got low biological activity or high biological activity, simple result of adding water back in that, whether it be precipitation or irrigation. If we have low ag of biological activity, those aggregates that are there begin to disappear very quickly. Uh, you can see them disappear within hours. And so one of the tests that we do in terms of, of soil health is what we call the wet aggregate stability test. And if you look at the wet aggregate stability, it's nothing more than placing a bunch of soil into a thing of water and see how quickly it dissolves. And you think about what happens in field operations. That's exactly what we do. When it rains on it, when we irrigate it, when we add water to it, if those aggregates are not stable, they begin to dissolve very quickly. And once they begin to dissolve, what they do is they revert back to their sand, silt, and clay. They form this nice puddled layer, and it forms that puddled layer that then limits the ability of water to go in, but more importantly, it limits the ability of that soil to exchange gases back and forth, particularly oxygen and CO2. It is so dramatic that it only takes a 30 second of an inch of crust to limit gas exchange between the soil and the atmosphere. So this is not something we have to build up a half inch and say, well, it blocks it. A 30 second of an inch is a pretty thin layer, but that's what it does in terms of the evaporation component, but also the oxygen exchange component. And the gas that's been most ignored in terms of soil health is oxygen. We spent a lot of time on CO2, uh, but an oxygen really becomes very, very important. And if you start doing literature reviews on the oxygen exchange between the soil and the atmosphere, it doesn't take much to go through that literature <laughs> because it just is not there. And it's one of the most critical things because everything that's below that surface requires oxygen to, to survive. And so that's one of the pieces that when we talk about soil health is the oxygen exchange. Uh, we now have the world's largest collection of oxygen sensors to start looking at this. Uh, and I'll just give you one example that comes out of the corn soybean area is that what we see in the spring is a lot of, of yellow corn. And everybody blames that on nitrogen, the fact that nitrogen leads through the profile and things like this. It has nothing to do with that. It's the limited availability of oxygen to that root system. And so we see those same things occurring, and it occurs because our soil is saturated and we have poor oxygen exchange. And so we see that same thing, and so that becomes an avenue of how do we begin to look at this system. If we have high biological activity, what we have is very stable aggregates. We can begin to rain on them. Uh, they're not quickly dissolving in terms of exposing the rain because those exudates are forming a much more stable aggregate. Uh, we see infiltration rates in these soils uh, in the order of maybe six to eight inches per hour. In that soil over there, less than an inch per hour. So that changes the whole dynamics, and if you look at the gas exchange, same thing, all these different pieces are changing. So when we look at all of this, we need to understand not what's happening in this upper foot, but what's happening in the upper half inch, because that is the critical gateway back and forth in terms of the overall dynamics of what goes on. So the science of soil health is that we assume we can change soil health without considering that we need to use biology as a first step. Uh, what's this whole biological complex below the soil that we're really thinking about managing? Uh, How does that biology begin to relate back and forth between what we want and what we don't want? Uh, 
the pathogenic versus the, the beneficials. And we have to realize that biology is linked to all the things that we consider as soil health. Just an example, uh, <coughs> corn residue and then a cover crop on that. Uh, one of the things that we see in a very positive impact uh, is that that residue on the surface modifies that microclimate. Uh, remember one of the things I said is we all want a stable environment. Uh, and we tend across a lot of our systems to, to think about from an entirely different dynamic is how quickly that soil warms up, how quickly it changes temperature, how quickly it changes uh, water content as well. And so when we have a bare soil surface, we see major extremes in terms of temperature. We see major extremes in terms of water content uh, as well. And so the biology has a hard time existing when the temperature goes from 40 degrees and the soil surface goes to 130 to 150 degrees during the day. Uh, we basically cook the biology out of our soil. Uh, you look at this, one of the major practices we do is, is solar, solarization <laughs> in terms of really heating that soil up to cook everything out. It's, that whole process is non-selective. It just cooks everything out of the soil. And so we need to understand just really where that dynamic fits in. The only difference between the passive and the active protective blanket is that, that cover crop and the same thing would apply uh, even in some of the rotation systems that, that you all do in terms of continually supplying exudate out of those root systems in terms of being able to provide a food source in that. The passive protective blanket uh, only has to exist on the old root system it's eating. This one you're continually supplying. And the longer we can keep that food source in there, the happier everybody is uh, in terms of these dynamics. We did a little experiment. Um, We've, we've gotten very interested in just how these things change uh, in soils and how to management practices. Uh, each one of the, we have uh, 12 different uh, columns of soil. These are 18 inches by 24 inches. They're undisturbed blocks of soil. That what we do is they're all instrumented with, uh, with soil temperature sensors, soil water sensors, CO2 sensors, oxygen sensors. We even collect the exudates at four different levels within that so we can look at what's being exuded out of each root system. Uh, these are all controlled environment systems. Uh, what we see is that uh, this is a case where we're running a biologically based fertilizer. You can see just what the cumulative CO2 was relative to uh, if we put on uh, UAN fertilizer as well. And so we're looking at how do aggregates form. I have a postdoc working on how do aggregates form in soil? How do they disappear in soil? What are some of the different changes looking on? And so uh, we now have soil out of Iowa and we actually have some soil out of uh, eastern Washington with that lust soil uh, that doesn't have a whole lot of organic matter uh, in it, less than a half a percent uh, from that standpoint. So we begin to see those changes as well. Uh, this is just the difference. And all this is indicating is the level of biological activity because Biological activity is just like you and I. Uh, they take in oxygen, give off CO2, so we can look at the CO2 levels within the soil, get an idea of what the uh, levels of uh, biological activity were within that, and so we can begin to look at this, and we begin to see those aggregate changes. Uh, as we begin to add cover crops, uh, we see very rapid changes in structure, uh, and we can go out and begin to see uh, changes in that soil within the first year. And you start looking, not digging up the whole spade, but looking very near the surface of what's going on uh, in all of this. My experiences in West Texas uh, is that that's on a sandy soil, and when we put, start putting a cover crop uh, into that system, we could be see color changes within the first two years in that light-colored soil because we were changing organic matter content that quickly and stabilizing the aggregates. Yield variation, uh, I do spend a lot of time in remote sensing uh, techniques for the last 30 years looking at how do we pick out different things within soil that becomes a fascinating thing because we now have technologies that we didn't have before. We have capabilities and wavelengths uh, and we've even gone to different pieces rather than reflectance but actually fluorescence uh, in terms of plant stress. There are some new technologies that we can begin to detect plant stress before the eye can even see it. Uh, and so that's going to give us, 
I think, some efforts going in in terms of, of how do we begin to monitor fields from a different perspective. This is just yield variation. We see this across fields. We need to understand in the dynamics of how do we stack all of these different levels up, not just one year, but five or six years, and working with producers and saying, are those areas consistent within a field? Are they variable within a field? What are the triggers within that? We now have the capabilities to be able to draw uh, those pieces together. Just an idea of, of really what biology does for you uh, in terms of this, in terms of the nutrient cycling dynamics. One of the things we discovered, this is just a, a biologically based fertilizer versus a, a stabilized urea. Uh, one of the things that we began to discover is that late in the growing season, we had a much better source of nitrogen, a much more available source of nitrogen in that profile because the biology was basically that making that nitrogen available that wasn't available in the commercial source. And so we see a lot of things that we call soil biological fertility uh, because that begins to supply that. So much different behavior in terms of the biological system and how nutrients are cycled within that soil compared to a commercial fertilizer. And so that begins to change the overall dynamics of the status of that plant and the healthiness of that plant as well. Because one of the things that we see is that the greener we can keep that plant, particularly if you're interested in grain, uh, the higher the yields. And so it's just a matter of how do we maintain photosynthetic activity. And once we maintain photosynthetic activity, we also continue to, to put more exudates back into that profile as well. Uh, and we need to be applying that to our specialty crops, the, the vegetables and things like this, that we really have not thought about how to put that together. So if you think about the impacts of soil health, uh, it does give us greater access to water within that soil profile. It gives us an increase in water use efficiency because the plant becomes more efficient. It has more availability of water in that. Uh, and a lot of that's related not to the water piece, but to the oxygen piece, so that those roots are much more functional uh, from a lot of standpoint. Uh, we give us greater infiltration rates. That stability of that upper half inch uh, gives us greater infiltration rates, but it's through gas exchange. And we see that more and more that that really becomes the overall piece of this. And then uh, an aspect that we really have not thought about recently, but actually was thought about 50 years ago, was how does biology begin to change the dynamics of nutrient cycling within a profile? And we need to rediscover <laughs> a lot of the old principles and put them back into place uh, and all of this. And we see uh, re it, that whole gas exchange is that we see a lot less pathogenic pressure because we've now changed the gas exchange. Uh, we're converting it from a CO2, an anaerobic situation, to much more of an aerobic situation, much more competitiveness of the beneficial uh, bacteria and everything else that's within that soil as well. Uh, and so we see that, and we see it in different pieces of that soil in terms of even little microcosms within that soil as well as what causes a toehold. The changing climate uh, that's out there, because one of the things that we projected in the last National Climate Assessment is that we're going to see much more of disease pressures, weed pressures, insect pressures with our changing climate. Uh, we're going to see, because of the rising temperatures, uh, a lot more favorability uh, because as air temperature rises, soil temperature is going to rise as well. That's going to expand the range in which a lot of our pathogens will have a toehold. Uh, it's going to add to more disease, uh, soil-borne uh, disease pressures. Uh, one of the things when we did surveys across the Midwest on specialty crops is that pests and diseases and their linkages to climate is the number one uh, concern by especially crop producers across the Midwest. Uh, they're seeing everything from increases in soil borne to splash of bacteria on plants, things like this. Uh, we're going to have a more variable condition uh, in all of this. Uh, California, Arizona, in terms of a lot of these conditions, uh, are going to become you're going to experience changes, but not the volatility that probably exists in the more temperate environments. Uh, the Mediterranean environments are going to be a little more stable from that standpoint. But nevertheless, uh, there's going to be changes that go in that. And we need to understand 
how that links to our soil environment as well. Getting us back to our stable systems, when we think about this in terms of those aggregates, is that when you think about these simple processes going on, and if we don't have a stable aggregate, uh, we begin to dissolve that aggregate and then we create that anaerobic condition very, very quickly uh, within that. And so we see those triggers, uh, we see differences in temperature uh, in all of this and all. So that upper inch, that upper half inch, is a critical part of the soil environment and we need to understand that uh, in terms of how it relates to disease. This fusarium relative to high temperatures and moist soil how does all of this fit together with the stability of our, of our soil surface? How do we begin to bring those pieces together? Because we do know that good soil health uh, leads to increased water movement and gas exchange, uh, and it reduces these high moisture conditions because if we can infiltrate much more uniformly, we don't end up with a ponded piece at the surface. Uh, so we begin to change the overall dynamics within that. Uh, and that's a piece that we need to understand, but we also need to start thinking about how do we interface with, with plant pathologists uh, and how do we bring these pieces together. And so that's why I get very excited about this project uh, because you see instant results <laughs> in a lot of cases, but you also see some places where we can bring together uh, different aspects of all of this. So with that, uh, I'll answer, I'll try to attempt to answer any questions that you have. <laughs> so it seems like you're, you're stressing soil biology, the importance of soil biology as it impacts aggregates. Right. right. And is this, is this suggesting that with hydroponic systems or soilless systems, soil where, where aggregate and structure is sort of defined in, in, in the matrix that you're growing the plant, that's, that the biology or the rises through biology is going to be less critical? Uh, that's a good, good question. I guess I hadn't thought much about hydroponics, although I did work with hydroponics uh, and then clear on my master's looking at the uh, rhizobium <laughs> uh, aspects of that. I know it was very critical that we kept air exchange within the hydroponics uh, to get the oxygen within that water. Uh, and if you had a pump failure, it wasn't too much before that, that plant was really under... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, microbiology? Yeah, it just... It, it's <laughs> completely changed the, the physiology of the plant. Yeah, yeah. Even though, the, even though the structure of the rise of the, uh, that's encasing the, the root system <laughs> is, remains the same, biology has changed, right? Oh, very quickly. Yeah. Within about a day. Balance of bowling ball on a pen, that's what managing hydroponic systems is like. Yeah. It changes very rapidly. Yeah, I, I can tell you how many times we destroyed something inadvertently <laughs> trying to look at. It's a very delicate balance. Yeah. If you ever want to, if you ever want to play with it and look at, look at, you want to simulate what happens in the in the in the, in the, in the natural agriculture or in a, in a conventional agricultural system, hydroponics is a great way to learn. Yeah. <laughs> what not to do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's, it, but. That, I don't think we under, appreciate, Barry, uh, how delicate these balances are uh, in all this system. And I think that when, and that's why I've been so focused on the, the whole oxygen exchange piece, because I think therein lies a lot of our, a lot of the dynamics that, that tip the balance in terms of whether it's, uh, we have prevalence of uh, fusarium or any other soil-borne diseases, and we don't. And so if we start looking across fields, does that become the, the triggering point? Uh, what triggers that uh, to occur? And, and I'll be honest with you, I mean, people are, we, we really have not focused on just how we bring those pieces together. <laughs> it, and can there be some uh, early indications of what's going on? Uh, if you look at, go back to the hydroponic thing, uh, that is so delicate that you, we rarely had any signals that things were out of balance until it was out of balance. And I, but I think in the soil environment, I think we have a lot more 
capacity to be able to have some prior indications that here's things that are out of balance. More resiliency in the yep. field as opposed to the, right. the cocoa board. Yep. <laughs> At least that's my hope. <laughs> there's, a huge, there's a huge buffer in capacity in terms of the biology right. in, in a conventional agricultural system. And you were asking about the biology in a hydroponic system. It, and that, what you're doing is, is, is you're artificially manipulating the environment. Yeah. There. And the, the major factors, oxygen, CO2 balance, pool chemistry, those are controlling factors. And then when you, when you start throwing biology in on top of that, it's, it's a whole another set of variables. Aren't you artificially controlling the, uh, the CO2 and oxygen environment in a hydroponic system, mm -hmm. ir irrespective of biology? Yeah, that's, it's all part of it. But if you throw the biology, if you throw biology in on top of that, and look at all the positive, you know, positive and negative organisms and the balance that you have to maintain with that, and 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 the full chemistry that goes on top of it, it's it, it becomes mind-boggling. And and I. I, I I got to see that firsthand, and it wasn't with hydroponic plants. It's actually with uh, catfish farms and some of the other ones. I mean, that is the epitome of a delicate balance. <laughs> uh, because you can go from killing out big ponds in, in a heartbeat, uh, just on, yeah, hours. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you some of the stories about Mississippi catfish farms and so. <laughs> But, but there you see in, in a lot of that, that balance really is, is important from the standpoint that a lot of the diseases that attack uh, the fish and shrimp that are growing in that blossom very quickly when that balance gets out of whack. And it's marginally out of whack. It's not big changes, it's very subtle changes. And so they really do pay a lot of attention. And I think we could learn maybe something from the aquatic systems of how soils are behaving. It's a good point. I really hadn't thought about how we go go with the aquatic people to get some of Yeah, I love that analogy. I'm going to have to use that in one of my diagrams of how do you balance a bowling ball on a, on a pin. Be a great illustration. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's that's a good question. And how do how do we begin to look at this? And and the concept that we've been working on is is what we call genetics by environment by management. So how do you take and optimize the genetics given all the different environment and then the management practices we put with that? Uh, and so one of the things that we we generally think about in our linear way of thinking is we only think about the genetics of that plant that's out there. But in reality, when we start thinking about the uh, diseases that go with that, you know, what's, what's the genetic triggers of a disease? Uh, what's the genetic triggers of that plant? Uh, what's the genetic triggers? And so I think we have to broaden our understanding of really how do, how do these genetic components fit together and how are they influenced by the environment, but also how are they influenced by the management that's out there. Uh, because we can trigger lots of different things by our inadvertent <laughs> management practices that we put into play at times. But we don't realize just what some of those consequences are. And so when we really begin to think about that, I mean, and I go back to my statement about we only understand five, we only know 5% of the soil microbiome. I think that begins a big avenue of, of how do we begin to look at these. Because most people, including researchers, are extremely leery of complex interactions. But in reality, producers live in complex interactions. And that's why we have to understand what 
producers go through. And, and one of the pieces that I tell people is that production agriculture is not rocket science. It's far more complex. <laughs> What's it take for rocket science? All you have to know is payload, force the gravity, and you figure out how much thrust to get the rocket into the air. Production agriculture is like trying to solve six or seven simultaneous differential equations. And most people get very glassy-eyed at two. But you all deal with all of these complex interactions all the time. And I think researchers got, research has to catch up with the fact that production agriculture is a very complex set of interactions that we don't fully understand. Well, we don't understand at all how those pieces fit together. And I think that's, if we're going to move forward, we're going to have to focus our attention on the interactions rather than the main effects. Because that really is going to be the key to helping a production agriculture survive, as well as prosper with all the different conditions we have going on. Paul. Can you give us any insight, <laughs> you back up and look at the broader <laughs> USDA, and we're talking about doing some of these efforts to address concern well and soil-borne diseases of leafy greens or Can you give us any insight into what USDA wants to support in these kind of efforts? I can speak for USDA, but not necessarily <laughs> whether they'll follow or not. Uh, the, uh, we've been pushing very hard in, in the past six months, and, and Frank is aware of this as, as well, that we need to be focusing on how do we improve the efficiency of agriculture. We have a thing we call the grand challenge. Uh, how do we improve production uh, by 25%, reduce the environmental impact by 25%? One of the pieces that we bought into play uh, about a year ago when we started this whole G by E by M complex was bringing uh, pathologists, entomologists, weed scientists into that complex with, with agronomists to begin to understand this. And so it really has become much more of a discussion point uh, and here in terms of the dynamics. And so I'm very hopeful that we're going to move forward quickly in how we begin to think about our research programs. Uh, how do we begin to think about uh, even some of the grant proposals that come in from the specialty crop arena uh, being much more targeted in these more complex interactions than, again, a single effect. There's, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not against single effects, but uh, the con contextually we need to figure out how we still integrate it into the production system uh, because that's where the, the dynamics really influence uh, the producers and how it helps them move forward in a lot of this. And so I keep pushing that. I've been pushing it to the NIFA. I've been pushing it to ARS that we need to change our whole way of thinking about how we begin to look at these puzzles. <laughs>